Hey guys, welcome to Do More, the channel where I interview people about business, entrepreneurship, investment, and being the best that you can be. Today, I talked to a guy called Paul Jambunathan, a clinical psychologist who's got nearly 40 years of experience in the industry. He's very celebrated, and today we discuss and really get into the nuts and bolts about the Malaysian psyche and what drives us as a race, as a people. If you like this video, like it, share it, comment in it, and tell us what you think. Thank you for dropping by. <laughs> Paul Jamunathan. Hey, man. Good the man evening. himself, brother. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> you have been analyzing Malaysians uh, and, and all their problems for the last 30, 40 years. Um, 37 plus? 37 plus, 37 plus Gosh, years. I feel old, man. <laughs> no, you're wise. But you, <laughs> compared to the Prime Minister, you're nothing. Okay? No, no, compared no. to the Prime Minister, you're a teenager. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. New kid. No, no, no. Compared to the Prime Minister, I know more than him. Yeah? In my field. Of course. Ah. Of course. So then I'm sure there's a few things you've picked up in your 37 years about the Malaysian psyche. Sure. Is there a Malaysian psyche? Most definitely. I don't think I've come across another nation as unique as ours is. I mean, there's so many parallels. You know? many, many nations have many diverse international cultures living within and all that. But our culture is so rich and so far, yeah. very deep. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is still un unidentified. Yeah. It's there. We know it's there, but it's not quantified. Yeah. But yeah, it's a pretty interesting country. La. Very interesting. In terms of the, the Malaysian psyche, the, the Malaysian personality, right? Uh, is there a commonality between, between the very disparate races of Malaysian, Malaysian and Chinese? Malaysian and Chinese. Yeah. Well, we're re re reducing it to those three, la, those okay. three numbers. Oh, okay, obviously <coughs> there's the, the whole East Malaysian side and the club bits. Punjabis, and, uh, Punjabis right, Indians. And, yeah. Indians are subdivision. Correct. Chinese are so good. Correct. You've got the Malayalis, you've got yeah. the Hindu, uh, you've got the Punjabis. Cortez, the Sri Lankans. <laughs> Okay, so okay, basically, right, if, if you were to be giving a presses to, for example, a, um, an incoming expat from the UK, for example, right? Okay. He's never been in Malaysia before. Right. He's never been in Southeast ah, Asia before, right? Get you. You're given, say, five minutes to describe the typical Malaysian and what drives them. What would you tell him? What would you tell her? The question is, Paul, what can I expect from the average Malaysian I bump, bump into the street? Yeah. First thing out, actually, honestly, very honestly, the first thing I'll say is um, you might bump into a particular race who's Malaysian. And if it's the three races, it'll bump into one of these three races. The one that looks like an Indian, the dark chocolate chocolate guy. Then the, chi the guy who looks like a Chinese man, yellowish, colorless kind of stuff. And then you'll see the <laughs> brownish guy, the milk chocolate, who's what we call the Malayla. And these are the three predominant races. Um, the, the one thing, honestly, the... The one thing I will tell people is, um, yeah, we live very nicely in unity, superficially, surfacely, but there's a lot of differences and disparities as you get deeper and deeper, uh, meaning when you talk about culture, religion, and things that divide us rather than un un unite us. I feel psychologically, there's a greater tendency of, for things that are latent and hidden that will more easily divide us than unite us. We spend a lot of time, a lot of energy with all the things that, are, are, that we try to unite us and keep us together and functioning as one, which I think is the best thing so far. I really think it's a good thing because the acknowledgement of the differences <clears throat> and the necessity to try and unite us is what's keeping us going. I think if we decide to deviate away from let's keep working at a unity of all, of all the differences and, and the uniqueness, I think we'll stay very divided. What do you think most unites Malaysians? Because, as you say, there's much more with that, that we're different about. Even you and I, right? We can talk the same language. We can watch the same football games. But we're actually very, very different. Yeah, absolutely. From, from the individual psyche, apart from national psyche, from just being an individual collection of molecules and DNA, we are all different. Very, very different. Yeah. And what makes it even more different is, well, that, that's what unites us. That, that's the only commonality worldwide that we are an individ uh, individual set of molecules and alleles or genes, and we grow up in a primary environment. That's what makes the difference. What we bring to the table, table as far as science is concerned now, things like uh, our, our, at present our knowledge of the DNA, our knowledge of genetics, what we bring to the table is everybody's different. The thumbprint is different. But what makes us different is this whole nature-nurture debate. So the nature is inherently different. Is there a nature? What Na is the, nature what, is in the DNA. What is the inherent Chinese? 
What is the inherent Malay? What is the inherent Indian? Your, your genetic makeup that's, that's come from that part of the world, the whole mutation that's developed in that part of the world, so, in the whole Chinese subcontinent, the, the Mongolian area, and the, the temperature, the, the production of the baby in the uterus, the nature of the uterus, the kind of blood flowing through your mother, in Africa, in Asia, in, in, in the North Pole, South Pole. It sets your... It sets your DNA. It modifies your DNA. So then the molecules take over. So your biology determines the kind of biological specimen you are. But that's not who you are. That is what you are, materially, genetically. Who you are and the kind of person you become is, is in the lap of nurture, how you're nurtured, the kind of food you're given. Given the fact that you're growing up in the, in the desert, you eat different foods, of course. That affects your biology. But also your mother, mother can cook you a steak in the middle of the desert, but steaks are not available. But the steaks are eaten in Europe. And then the food, different foods are eaten elsewhere because your mother cooks it for you differently. Your mother loves you differently. They speak a different language. The different belief systems that are ta taught, different uh, obedience principles that are taught. So that, that's the nature, the input that then designs the character and the personality of someone. So the nurture is what really differentiates us from one another. <clears throat> so that brings us down to this culture. Lah. The culture, the inherent teaching principles, the values, um, there's a simple formula that I teach first-year medical students. It's, it's reductionistic, no doubt, but I reduce a lot of complex ideas so that the layperson can understand it. The best way or the easiest way to look, and understand, to look at and understand a human being is how they present in any given situation. Present themselves? <laughs> present or behave <clears throat> okay. in a given situation. And we call that covert signs. Uh, sorry, overt signs. Overt signs. Overt. You cannot okay. see the covert issues. The things okay, that are working so that's in body head. language, right? Body language, things they say, things they do, anything observable. Okay, give <clears throat> some examples. Um, how you talk, how you walk, your eye contact, your, your head gestures, the kind of words you use, how aggressive you are, the kind of perfume you use, the way you dress, um, all these things, your hairstyle, your color, anything that's observable, So anything as part of your presentation. Now... Um, uh, so that's, that's the easiest way to look at people. Now, when you look at behavior, what's be what forms that behavior are attitudes. Your attitude, my attitude towards you at this moment in time might be one of anger. And that attitude will drive my behavior towards you. I, I'm, I'll be few in words with, the, with you. I'll be curt. You know, I'll be, I'm not interested. I'll look down or stare at you, things like that. But if my attitude towards you is one of loving and acceptance, my whole language vocabulary will be different. I'll give you a hug, shake your hand, sit down with you, pat you on the back. So that designs the behavior. But what designs attitude is something very fundamental. It's called values. Now these are even more covert. You might may or may not be aware of your values. <clears throat> now these values are what drives attitudes and attitudes determine behavior. Now, where do you pick up values? Values are not in your DNA. <clears throat> Perhaps Darwin can argue that given the principles of uh, survival and, and natural selection, yeah. that we are born with the value of keeping ourselves alive. So those are the base values. Yeah, but presumably that race would, would, would dictate values. Your religion might dictate values. I, exactly. Your, so your, from your the affluence relatively of your family. I, there you go. Now we're talking. Where you live. Now what we're neighborhoods talking. neighborhoods you, you stay in. So, yeah. So when, when Darwin says you are born as a set of molecules to survive, he's absolutely right. The brain will do anything to survive. But altruism, because I fall down in a drain, you see me suffering. Who asks you to cross the street and help me? No, Darwin didn't suggest that. But the, the same species drive to help another species in trouble drives you to do that. And you do that out of natural selection. I want to help, you know, the, the, the survival of the species kind of th stuff. But the desire to help is not in your DNA. You want to survive. If I'm in a drain and you are standing up and there's some food on the road and we're the last two people on earth, you'll say, let the guy in the drain die because I need to eat. I want to survive. Are there generalizations to be had between the Chinese, the Indians, and the Malays? Because, okay, let, let me start by generalizing. So then you don't get into too much trouble, right? <laughs> so the Malays are generally seen to be much more gentle, much more passive in a way, um, driven by a very genteel, almost, um, almost rural culture, yeah? And typically in the past, historically speaking, they used to be vulnerable people. But they, they seem to be changing quite fast, right? 
Uh, the Chinese, on the other hand, have, have, I think, anecdotally speaking, gone through centuries of hardship and toil back home in China, f famines and what have you. They are very aggressive, very hardworking. They will do whatever it takes to survive. And those that have survived until now have been a result of those that have not survived in the past. So you, you see the ones that the, who are the hardiest today. And then the Indians, right? Traditionally, the Indians are a little bit more like the Chinese in terms of their back, background. Um, but, but perhaps because, because I think they do come in at a certain different societal level, there's a little bit of a inferiority there. That, that's the generalizations we have in our minds. Right. Is that true? Yeah. In your opinion? Because <laughs> no, I know you didn't want to get someone into too much trouble, so I'll, I'll say those No, things. I didn't want to generalize in terms of um, making a cross-section and saying this is what everyone represents. Because within Chinese, there's Hokkien, there's Cantonese, yeah. there's Tao, you know. And different parts of China behave differently. Okay. North, uh, south, yeah. That's right. And, and I, 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 I learned to understand that if the Malaysian Chinese is different from the mainland Chinese absolutely. and Hong Kong Chinese and, we have and Taiwan Chinese. nothing in common with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing. Yeah, probably just pigmentation, basically. Yeah. And maybe some DNA, definitely. But the nurture principle has differentiated you guys differently. Okay. Now, when you say, let's, let's start with your opening statement, the Malays. The way you went on to describe things sounds very agricultural. And don't forget, the discovery of the Malay race is recent. As compared to the discovery of the Chinese race. The evolution of the Chinese race, maybe younger, maybe older, but that's a timeline. They were agricultural. They were hunters, gatherers. As most of us were. As most of us were. And, it, that, and even then, the geography determines the extent to which you are. Where you are, temperate countries, winter countries, tropical, equatorial countries. So they determine where you are. Now, the, the, the time and duration of your existence will tell you how you've evolved. Now, when you throw in the Malays, you'll find that we grew up in this abundant country with everything. More agriculture than China had. Has that made them more laid back than the next guy? Well, the effort is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. It's the effort put into survival that has determined the way you live every day. We didn't have to go chasing after tigers to eat them. We didn't have to expend that much energy. The food just grew because it was our agriculture. It was just so abundant. It determined the amount of physical kinetic potential potential energy you had to convert to kinetic energy to determine the amount of food you you you, you harvest and eat. So it set a kind of behavioral pattern. Now, this is sociology and anthropology talking. Yeah. You, you talk to the anthropologist, he'll, he'll, he'll go to town with this. But now, we are industrializing. A different kind of attitude and value system is necessary to drive that attitude. But now you're putting the Chinese man who is migrating for a reason. He's come, come into the peninsula for a reason. He's meeting the, the Malay man who's already here, existing with a certain pattern of behavior. Now, in between, you throw in another country's representative, like the Indians, who themselves has got a very wide vertical presentation of being like the Chinese and having industrialized, etc. But it's so dis the dis disparity is so obvious that you have the kind of really poor poverty-driven people who are waiting for food from heaven to drop. You bring these people and throw them into the mix as well, then you get a, a wide variety of people who had different lifespans and stages of not just their personal development, but the whole cultural development. So in your 37 years of experience, does it shock you, Jambu, mm. that there's only been ever one significant and material clash between the races in this country? No. I don't believe there's only one. There's been I, many, many... I believe it's happening every day. Okay. It's happening every day. We are sensitized to it. We are sensible about it, and we are dealing with it every day in a very civil way. It's that we all recognize the differences. We just don't want to talk about it, and there are acts and policies to keep that in place so that the pimple doesn't become more uh, venomous and burst. So some time ago, I spoke to the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Tun Ma there, right? And he basically left it on in no uncertain terms that the social contract will go on. Yeah. The, uh, the affirmative action, in whatever guise it takes over the long term, will have to go on. And I think from a social, ex it's not even a social experiment anymore, it's a social panacea for an, a problem which, as you know, as you, as you just described, exists. It exists. And I, and I believe as a psychologist, um, the more aware we are that it exists, the more we are aware of our differences and why those differences are there, 
the better we will be as interactive human beings. Okay, but the problem is, if you give someone aid for a long time, for perhaps for, for, for forever, yeah. that person does not learn how to compete. Oh yeah, if you carry a young child forever, they'll never learn to walk. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the yeah. feet will, will go through atrophy, the muscles will die, they'll never learn to walk. And I've seen that happen with, with new rich uh, parents. They don't allow their precious ch children to ever talk, walk on the ground and they'll grow up spoiled. Yeah, yeah. I know a child who's got grass phobia, never stepped on grass because they grew up in a condominium. So if you were a policymaker in Malaysia and you knew this to be the case, from a scientific point of view, it's proven many times over, what do you do? Do you allow this to happen? Do you try and withdraw? You try and withdraw, you lose your votes, you lose your votes, you can't be in government. What can you do over the long term? <laughs> We're back to the same old word. Huh? It's, it's, uh, it's been thrashed and overused. But I think we need to reevaluate our education system. Really, the way we, we educate, it's not about literary, literization. It's not about teaching how to read and write. It's about inculcating values. You know, we'll never get everyone educated. We'll never get everyone through school up to Form 5. No, that doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me at all. Some of the wisest people I know are people who haven't passed, haven't been through Standard 6, Form 5. Our past civil servants who are Tansris and all, some of them don't have a degree even. Yeah. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What matters is the values that are inculcated and how educated you are, how you think and process information. Now, that is never taught in schools. So... On the basis that you can't, by yourself, unilaterally change the education minister, nor can you, <laughs> nor can you change policy, yeah. nor can you change the entire country. You can change yourself and yeah. how you treat your children. Right. All right. Right? Yeah. Yep. Because education starts at home. Yeah. What is the right approach? Is there a right approach? Yeah, there, to, there to is. To make your child as competitive as he can be or he or she or No, why competitive? Be, right? As he, as he or she can be, the best person that he or she can be. Oh. Okay. To be the best equipped to deal with this volatile, bloody world that is changing so fast before our very eyes. Okay, then you teach adaptation. Then you teach about you teach the person about keeping an open mind and that nothing is fixed. You equip that person. How do you teach and adaptation? You give them a toolkit. How do you teach adaptation? You, you give them a toolkit. Um, um, teach them to be prepared to change a car tire if at all a car tire falls flat. Because you never you never get a flat tire ten times in your lifetime, basically. No, but you are prepared to, you know where the jack is, you know how to use one. But I got scolded a few months ago. People shunned me and scolded me because I was in the middle of the day, outside a hotel, I got my daughters to change the car tire. <laughs> Brilliant. And a how old are they? Uh, well, they're now 28 and 23. They were about three years ago. They yeah. were 23 and minus four. Brilliant. Kids. Brilliant. Now, I was there holding an umbrella, no doubt. It was midday. We just finished a session in a conference and people were milling out. I was there in the sun with them before lunch and they were changing a car tire and I was just standing there with an umbrella. Yeah. People actually looked at me and I just delivered a talk so they knew who I was. Oh, you look at you, like Jambu, so bad. You're making it chill. Your daughter's changed the car tire. Girl, some more. Girl, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Right, and then girls. my daughter, who had just done her nails, decided to show off her nails. Like, See, my nails are so gone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she added fuel to fire. <laughs> but... We had planned that. We had planned that they wanted to learn to change the tire. Brilliant. So we changed I'm, a perfectly good tire. Yeah. But we were equipping them for in future because they took the car during the conference. And I said, you guys know how to deal with it, huh? What if you have a flat, you know how to deal with it? No, no, dad, teach us after we come back. But we were equipping them to deal with a potential problem. Now, you've got to teach your children how to be resourceful, how to deal with change, how to run with change, even though it may not happen, but do we teach that? We don't teach that. No, we don't. We sh don't that, that kind of adaptability and, and uh, resourcefulness has to be delivered rather than the mathematics, rather than the biology, rather than let's teach science in English or in Malay. I mean, that, those debates, black or white shoes and all, for me, that's not important. We can laugh about it. These are soft skills which parents don't really think about when they want to raise their children. This is what I run. I run tuition. I'm so dead against tuition. So dead against a child, they eat at this time of the day, 5.15, school has finished. Yeah. You just drive past some famous tuition centers, children are sitting in cars, having their dinner with their mother in the car, yeah. waiting for the tuition center to open, then they'll be there till 9 or 10, yeah. then they come home and sleep, and they're doing their homework in their dreams, and then they wake up, go to school, and the same rigmarole happens day in, day out. But there's a, there's a curriculum that's absent. Now, all my clients, over all these years, from any age group, they come to me because there's a problem. 
they cannot solve. What we do together is we problem solve. It could be a deep-seated emotional rape-based trauma, post-traumatic based issue. It could be uh, making choices in life, anything. Dealing with the divorce, dealing with death, any, but anger, issues like that. <clears throat> now, when I finish the sessions and we, we kind of get them back on track and they're, they're problem solving, they're living effectively, what I note down is what skill deficit was missing. So I have this list <clears throat> of all the medication or intervention processes, all the skills that have been missing all these years. <clears throat> and I have a list, a very long list, of what I call the absent curriculum. Things that are not taught in schools and people are suffering from them as a deficit issue. So they come in, they've lost out of this skill, never had the skill taught to them. Problem solving, anger management, stress management, learning how to use a clutch in a, in a car. So they don't have what I call the emotional clutch. Press it, hold on to it, let it choose the gear, change the gear, decide <laughs> forward or reverse. So they don't have that kind of stuff. Immediate de gratification, delayed gratification, uh, so many things. Relaxation, lepa, learning to lepa structural in a constructive manner. Now we've forgotten <laughs> all this, <clears throat> learning to walk and do nothing. So many wonderful skills we've never we never teach them because we're so worried about making money and doing other priorities. And like, losing out. Uh, yeah. Losing out on fundamental survival stuff. Yeah. But so I call this the absent curriculum. So when you ask me what skills to teach, that's my tuition center. My tuition center, which runs very selectively, is like 10, 12 modules or five modules or 20 modules. What we do is I teach them one or two hours for one week. You learn this skill, go home and practice it, come back, revise and learn another skill. Things like problem solving, anger management, introduction to anger, things like that. This, no one teaches. And then what is passed on genetically, behaviorally, socially, observational learning is how the mother, father deal with it. In fact, they're not around. How the maid deals with it. Yeah. That's your primary environment. They learn the same thing. History repeats itself till you hit a challenge. And then you have a skills deficit and you have a problem because you're frustrated. Goals can't be met. So what is our education curriculum about? <clears throat> not black shoes, white shoes, math, science, English, Malay kind of stuff. Not that, not how heavy your bag is. That is all superficial stuff. The reality is, what content are you teaching? And how are you preparing the human being to be a human who is being? You know, being what? Being powerless, you know, choiceless. You've got to be something. What are the most essential skills that young people must learn in this day and age? Well, I'll put number one on my list, which, which my wife and I co-decided, co-curriculum design was um, things like self-awareness, being aware of what you're doing, when you're doing. I think that is fundamental, okay, crucial. Okay, that's interesting. Being, that's being, fascinating. Uh, Why? Being aware because you've got to know what you're doing when you're doing. If not, you'll never, never be in control and never have choice. Okay, interesting. So awareness is, I think, the most fundamental skill to develop. Okay, great pause. Pause. There's, there's a whole recipe of things to learn, right? <laughs> but awareness, the self, the yeah. being them, that is something that which is now only just emerging in it's public been consciousness. Around, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Among society. But they right? sell it to the elite for years and donkeys Correct. years. Like Correct. You go to this great resort Correct. and become aware. Correct. Yeah, the Beatles, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the yogi, right? Yeah. Um, how does that lead to control? How does it lead to um, control over your own life? No, that leads to choice. Choice. That leads to choice. Once you become aware of, of who you are, what you are, it gives you greater choice. You have more, more options. And okay, define awareness about oneself. Knowing your, social, knowing your cognitive processes, one thing. Having emotional intelligence about how you're feeling. Maybe even to the extent of, maybe to some extent of why you're feeling this way. If you have enough intellect, don't forget your cognitive developmental stage. You know, you're a little boy, little girl. You don't know why you're feeling angry. But you can say you're feeling angry, you can express yourself. When my kids were very young, I had three colored chairs. So I'm, I'm high into, not high into, I'm high because of steroids or that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> you're ill, yeah. I'm ill, I'm ill, very, yeah. very ill. But um, I wanted them to learn, develop an emotional vocabulary. Because I, both of us, my wife and I both felt that an emotional vocabulary is very important when you connect with people. Yeah. We, are, we are people, people person. Yeah. And so I wanted to teach them words to do with emotions and expressions. 
And we taught them the three fundamentals, happy, sad, angry, or frustrated. So I bought this kindergarten chairs, plastic chairs, and I classically conditioned, or I taught them that the red is angry, because the red lights are red, you know, da, 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 fire. Eh? Blue is, uh, is sad, because of the language we use. And yellow is happy, bright sunshine. Yeah. And when I come home, if I ask, how are you feeling, darling, after the huggy, huggy, wuggy, wuggy, all that? We'll say, okay, show me how you're feeling, and they'll go and sit on a chair. And then I'll say, oh, you're feeling upset today. Huh? Why, sweetie? And then they'll come and say, the doggy didn't come to see me. The doggy didn't come and lick me. And so we'll start things like that going. So from that kind of premise, we are now at a premise where, uh, a situation where if I come home now and they're 23, 24 years old, I say, hi, darling, how are you? How's your day? Very frustrating, la dad. So now it's a verbal expression. And let me just go to the loo, come back, and we'll sit and chat about it, okay? And then we sit and we talk about it. So <laughs> learning that that emotional intelligence and developing that vocabulary begins to get you um, clever with yourself and then have choices of expression. And then when a problem persists, you have options to develop. When you choose an option, you're already in control. That's where the control is. <clears throat> now, in control, there are two kinds of loci. The locus of control is either internal, which is mine, I, I, I'm, I'm in control, or it's external. Everyone is in control. Just like a student who fails an exam and gets lousy results. The student who has external locus of control, who is more liable to depression and suicide and things like that, they attribute the whole result to that bloody lecturers are purposely set a difficult exam. La. They tried, they were out to get me. Yeah. But the internal locus of control guy will say, I got poor results because, damn it, I've had too much party time. I didn't study. La. <laughs> so they got control. Okay, so self-awareness is one. <clears throat> what else? Honesty. Honesty. Honesty okay. with self. La. Honesty with self because that's related to self-awareness, right? Yes. Because if you're not honest about how you feel... Then you can choose to be dishonest with somebody else. That's right. I, I lie to my mum regularly. I mean, mum will say, are you tired? No. How are you feeling? Great. I'm down in the dumps. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, how are you feeling? Great. No problem. So um, that kind of lies. Like, you know. Lies, oh, that's another thing. Lies are not always bad, la. There's something called the psychology of lies. It's a brilliant yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I've run a couple of shows on that. Um, it's the interface. Lies is known as the interface between the internal reality and the external reality. And that interface is how, you, how these two match. La. So if you want to keep this private and secluded, you lie to the external reality. Yeah. If you want to keep it open, you tell your friends, oh, this is me. Hello, no lies. This is, what you see is what you get. So there's no lie there. La. But I don't want my mom to suffer like me. So I'd say, yes, I'm... I'm not hungry, although I'm famished. Yeah. If not, she'll be there at 11 o'clock at night making a sandwich. Like. <laughs> so you lie. Like. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, How do you teach honesty, though? Because children are, are by nature, some, well, most of the time, they are, they're not maliciously dishonest, but they are dishonest. No. <clears throat> the lying behavior, according to what I've learned, <clears throat> and, I, and I believe it, I buy it, lying is a behavior, it's a strategy. Just like, okay, it's, it's biologically determined to a large extent. Camouflage is a lie. But camouflage is not who you really are. But because of the situation, you're disguised. Mm. And you, you, you have lied about so your presence. So there's a means to an end. <clears throat> there's, a means. there's a reason for that, survival. Makeup and cosmetics is a lie. Absolutely. The clothes we wear is a lie. We put it on, we take it off. It's a facade. <clears throat> it's a, it serves a purpose. For whatever reason, let's not justify the reason. I want to look better or whatever. Or I want to accentuate certain characteristics. Perfume is a lie. I mean, let's just, everyone live with body odor every day. You know? yeah. So when you, when you distort the truth, it's called a lie. When you prevaricate, it's a lie. That's all. Whether it's a good lie, bad lie, punishable by law lie, it's a different kind of lie. <clears throat> the policy will decide what to include in that lie. But the lie carries on and, and translocates itself into things like the truth about behavior and interpersonal effectiveness and how it affects other people's choices and their rights. But the problem is, if you don't lie, and politicians will tell you that they're the first people to be guilty of it, if they don't lie, they don't get the votes. <coughs> they don't get the votes, they don't go into power. They don't go into power, they can't dictate policy. And they cannot bring change. And they can't bring change. And however well-meaning they are. However well-meaning they are. And the literature will tell you that most research is done with marketing agents and politicians. That's right. They, they notice... They're, they're noted to be the biggest liars. Right. So, yeah. But that, that's stats for you. And even stats. 
There's their things. lies, their damn lies, and then the statistics. Yes, that's exactly that order. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, st- stats is the worst, but we need yeah. stats like, okay. to give us some direction. So if you teach a child honesty, are you not setting that, that child up for failure in life? No, but you've got to teach them the power of dishonesty and when to use it. Now, when you lie, now, I, I, I was starting with the biology of lies. Huh? So it's a natural tendency to survive, to, li- to lie, to survive. You will do that. However, psychologically, in a developmental process, lies also are part of the, the development of the process of individuation. Yes. When you grow up as a group of an, as one of a group of animals, and you want to individuate, your mother and father want all the children to dress up the same, behave the same. We belong to the the, the Ku family, the Chong family, whatever, whatever you know, we, the Jambunathan family. We all wear the same clothes. But this identity is an important thing for them. Lah. But you're growing up, you're growing up developmentally, you're going into adolescence, you're becoming your person, your own being, your own gender, da di 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 da <laughs> And then you want, to, you want to be yourself. Yeah. You've got to start lying. Lah, because if not, you'll have to belong to the tribe and the tribal dance, the tribal movement, the tribal uh, trend of thinking. So you start lying lah, to break away. So this internal, external reality starts dividing. And lying helps you individuate. And so once you individuate, and if you're honest to yourself, you know when you're lying, when you're not. So to be an elegant liar, to be a strategic liar, yeah. to know when to lie, to get ahead. Not necessarily Those, get ahead, to be, to be different for a reason. To cope. To cope, to adapt. So that's a very fine line. Yes. And that's I, down, down to your value system again. That would be bloody hard to teach, but... I don't think it'll be hard to... It's hard to teach now because things are written in stone already. To crack, but if you start it early enough in a family, like if you have the right kind of marriage, no, forget marriage preparation, that's there. Parent preparation. You want to have babies. Yeah. Jambu, put us through a course. La. We need a license to drive a car. Nobody ever has a license to bring up children. La. And this is the bloody hardest job of all. No, it's worse. It's worse, man. Look at it now. You have a child. I mean, you prepare for all the the sexual intercourse and the whole production material, all that, you, you pay so much, you get everything so much. Order. Those are traditional problems. Now you've got social media. Social media is the worst. That, but after you produce the baby, you abdicate your responsibility and you rent it out to a maid to bring up. Incredible. You rent it out. You have to earn money to pay the maid to look after your child. Yeah. Who's teaching the invisible values? Yeah. You're at home, you spend how much time with your child? I, I thrash that point home many, many times on everything I do. Less than 20 minutes, less than 10 minutes a day. La. The values are intrinsic. The values are subconsciously taught. You're learning other. You're learning Indonesian values, Bangladeshi values. You're learning so it's, the Popuri values, is even yeah. worse. Yeah. <coughs> Nepali, Vietnamese, Cambodian in a Chinese household, married to a Malay woman who's got an Indian uncle <laughs> who's got a durian relative. Yeah. <laughs> My God, this is amazing. <laughs> okay, so you got self awareness. You got honesty. What else? Motivation. <coughs> Developing a reason. Things like finishing what you start, things like that. But one of the things I did was... Is that nature or nurture? Nurture. Motivation. Nurture. Motivation to live is one thing. I mean, the person who's depressed clinically, their motivation to live is gone. Because you become hopeless and then you have no resources, you become helpless. And these two states, hopelessness and helplessness, results in self-destructive behavior and say, I'd rather die now. Because there's no more hope. So to keep hope going, they must have a reason for hope. The reason would be, I want to be me. I want to be happy. I want to be something. So even the criminal, the bad guy, wants to be. He's got motive. How do you teach a whole country motivation? Especially when things are so easy. You know, you've got fruits falling from the trees. You've got fish swimming in the rivers and the seas. You've got... Abundant soil and clean, you know, uh, healthy soil. It's so easy here. There's seafood, there's vegetables, there's oil coming from the ground. How do you overcome this? Oh, this, my uh, question to you is why? What's eating? the problem? What's the problem? Yeah, yeah. Enjoy it. Why has it become a problem? <laughs> why are we worried about people who live off the land and, and the resources? Why is it a problem? I didn't say it was a problem. No, but why are people upset about it and saying some people are lazy, some people are not? 
Okay. I don't see a problem. Because, because we've got a country that wants to live in the economy and right. wants a free a capitalist economy. Yeah. And we see our neighbors in Indonesia and Thailand and, and Vietnam overtaking us and we, we get worried and we think, oh, we're not going fast enough and all that. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, yeah. so there are other people who live off the land who are lazy, as is said. There are some people who have to work for a living, okay? And they don't like the disparity. They're jealous. Uh. They're worried. Uh. So is the guy living off the land, eating my money? Yes, I'm earning, I'm paying more taxes. Yeah. He's not earning. So why don't you then choose to work like him? The opportunity is there. Or why doesn't he choose to live like you? The opportunity is there. Now they've made their choices. Is the choice yours? Or are you forced to do the choice as an individual? What are the choice you have? Now, I'm going to walk on very treacherous ground here. <clears throat> do you have choices in your life? There is no such thing in my books as making the right choice. No such thing. Making the right choice. My books spell out the ability to make a choice and make it right. What is right? Making it work for you to meet your agenda. That's all. You're making it right. Do I marry? <clears throat> I can marry a million women and make it right. I choose to, given the options I have. I met this person, I marry, I have, and make it right. Make it functional. Now, if I don't like what I see happening in this shop that I walk into to buy my dinner, I have a choice. Sit down, complain, moan and groan, or say, forget it, I'm going to the next shop. Make your choice. And once you make your choice, you live with your choice and make it right. Don't look next door and say his food is better. Lah. You have a choice. We can change jobs. We can change where we live. We can change so many things. But to sit down and complain at the comfort and happiness level of somebody else is, I feel, a very uncomfortable zone and you're undermining yourself. We have choice. And we have to take control of you. If you feel there's social injustice, then bring it to the social platform and bring about change. Then we come to things like the prayer of ser serenity. It's just a quotation. You know? Yeah. you know that one about knowing what I can change, what I cannot change, and knowing the difference. Yeah, that's exactly where we have to be. There is a certain time in one's life where you say, I've done my best and I cannot change anything anymore. I really cannot change anything anymore. I have to live with this. And if you can live with it, live with it. If you can't, fight, turn every stone and say, now I can live with it because I've done everything. Now, the, the, the other skill that we need to have is spirituality. And I, I, I link this with what I call interconnectedness, connectivity with the world and energies around you. Whether you like it or not, we are a being full of energy, electrical impulses, chemical impulses. We are energy itself. And so are you. And there's physically, purely based on physics, your energy and my energy are interacting at the moment by words, by looks, by smell, by everything. <clears throat> and when you're in a group of people, there is collective energy. So I'm not talking about religiosity. I'm talking about spirituality, the, the, the existence and the being. Now, teaching that realization is an important thing too because you and I affect one another. So the other skill I'm looking at is interpersonal effectiveness how we affect other people, how you affect me. If I'm alone at home, I behave differently. You walk in, things, everything changes. Somebody else walks in, everything changes. When I'm in a group of people, if you're by the beach alone, and then somebody comes and shares the beach with you 30 feet away, your attitude changes already. 200 other people come, it changes already. Because not just the energy, but the whole atmosphere, the reality changes. Now, being aware of that reality and the energy and presence of other people, I'm not talking about helping to heal energy-wise somebody in London at the moment. No doubt, we have this thing called Effecto Mariposa, the butterfly effect, where a small flutter of wing here can change the energy in the world and the whole thing can form a tsunami somewhere else. I believe it can happen in terms of physics, but in terms of human interaction, it does happen. A word, especially with social media now, what I post now, can cause disaster in London. It can, it can cause a terrorist attack somewhere else. What I do now in one word, if I post it, can affect, it can have a tsunami effect elsewhere. But if you bring it down to reality, it can cause disaster at home. 
It can cause, cause disaster in this space between the few of us. It can, loads of things can happen, but having that knowledge and awareness that what you do can affect you and other people is another important skill. How do you improve yourself in that area? Oh, this firm, famous thing called personal development. Yeah. Being out, being educating yourself. Like, we're back to that thing. Like. Yeah. And st- Maslow. Like. Go back to Maslow. You know the Maslow's law. Maslow's yeah. hierarchy of hierarchy, needs. Hierarchy, yeah. Uh, you get all the fundamentals met. And the highest is self actualization, uh, which is strongly linked the to. The highest is self actualization. Yeah. Being the best you are, the best you can be given all your strengths. Okay. So it's being actual, so actualization. Um, there is something called uh, choice theory, where you reach a certain point in time and life where you make choices, you make the best of choices, you make it happen in the here and now. Um, there's something called reality therapy, where this is your reality. Okay? This is your reality now, and you're living with lazy people, you're living with competitive people, you're living with all kinds of people, but this is your reality. You make the choice, you make the choice work for you. Forget how you're brought up and how your father thrashed you or how your uncle raped you or how the economy let you down or how the prime minister wasn't a good or bad man. Forget all the past. Forget Freud and all his stuff. Forget about what's going to happen in the future. Forget the nuclear war that's about to happen. But given today and now, what choices are you going to make? What responsibility are you going to take over your choices? That's choice, uh, ther- choice theory. But I, I believe a lot of the past has to do with things. Huh? Now, self-actualization, are we teaching our children, are we teaching the next generation of, not people and citizens, are we teaching the next generation of parents? Because they're going to produce children. So we are yet to produce the new Malaysia. We're producing them. Some are still in in utero. (laughs) But they're going to come out and get to the same system. The system hasn't changed. The the content of your... The system still remains the same. The content still remains. But the, 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 the... Design of the curriculum hasn't. We need to change the content. We need to introduce new curriculum. This Jawi writing and all in school, I see them all, everyone's got their knickers in a twist. <laughs> and I'm laughing to hell because they have, they have worried about the wrong thing. <laughs> the attitude and the values behind it is what matters to me, not the, the issue of Jawi. Um, they still haven't talked about anger management. They haven't talked about things like emotion regulation, emotion intelligence. Emotional intelligence, they're still hung up on IQ, not on EI. They're hung up on EQ. There's, I don't believe there's such a thing as EQ. You cannot put a quotient to your emotion. That means the older, quotient is the divisor, you know? Yeah. That means the older you get, the more stupid you are. La. <laughs> yeah, you know, the divisor gets bigger. Yeah. Um, even Daniel Goldman, the author of EQ, he's now very nicely migrated back to EI, which is emotional intelligence, which belongs to a professor... Uh, Salovey, Peter Salovey, he's the president of Yale. Um, are we intelligent enough in terms of our emotions? Uh, you know the word motivation we spoke of earlier? Motivation comes from the word motion, which means to move. Yeah. The whole issue of motivation and motion, is the Latin derivative of that yeah. is emotion, that which makes you move. So for every human behavior, however peculiar, there's an emotion. We may or may not be aware of it. <coughs> But consciously, if you are aware of it, or you can design it. Unconsciously, you don't know what drives you. Why the hell did I say that? I shouldn't have said it post-event. So being emotionally intelligent, I'm feeling angry now. Let me choose my words. I'll use my emotional clutch, pause, and then select. Wow, you're intelligent. Emotional intelligence is knowing my emotions, perceiving your emotions, and getting these two to work for a common good or a mutual outcome. Is it true that the owners of these soft skills, the ones who have mastered these soft skills, uh, are more um, likely to succeed in life? Yes. Depends on what you, how you define success. Exactly. How do you define, define success? I will talk about succeed. I will talk, I'll use the word happiness very carefully. Yeah. Um, I will use the word flourishing. I'll use the word not languishing. I'll use the word physiology. I'll use the word immune. Why physiology? Whether health. you're healthy. Okay. I'll use the word immune system. Whether your body is defending itself well. Low infections. Your prognosis of long life. Now, happiness is all these things thrown in. If it's going to be your bank account, you can be happy tomorrow, get $100 million, and then die the day after. And still be going through a divorce. 
uh, whether you want it or not. <laughs> you want it, great. Yeah. But um, happiness depends on how you, de- how you define success, how you define happiness. Do you think that we're fixated on the wrong things that define success? I don't think so. I won't, I won't say that we're fixated on the wrong things. I think our emphasis is on the wrong things. Yeah, maybe you're right. Fixated. Like. So we, are, we overemphasize certain things. We define things that, success as the big car and the big house and the big neighborhood. Or the big money that can buy you money. what you want. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is, that's a problem. I, I once did an a, a undergraduate essay on the psychology of poverty. And I was living in Klang at the time. I was studying in the UK. I used to take the train to KL back and forth. And I used my camera and did a photo essay and research. And I found that the, the people living along the KTM slums, along the railway lines, they displayed, displayed more happiness than the people in, the, in Bangsa and Damansara that was just coming up at the time, the mid-80s. Um, the children were behind gates and a few families had, had armas and maids, but they were behind gates looking at the children playing barefoot in the developing mud in front. The guys in the, the KTM slums by the railway line were playing on swings with their father and mother sitting there after work and they were having more fun, observably, than the children who are going to tuition class. Now, I would say there, were far more, there, was, there was more happiness in poverty than in, in luxury. So it's very subjective. That's a fascinating concept there because some countries around the world, like say Bhutan, yeah. who now have this, um, uh, what they call the GHI, the, the Global Happiness Index. Global Happiness yeah, Index. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they measure their development in the economy by uh, this nebulous concept called happiness. Yeah. And even France, I think, started to adopt that thinking with yeah. Sarkozy. Yeah. Um, but for most of the world, including Malaysia, we define development and progress by, by GDP, by economic output. That's the government's definition of happiness. Yeah. The government, the, 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 the audit at the end of the day yeah. is by numbers, yeah. by taxes. But for the individual, it's up to you to develop your own audit system at home. I mean, yeah, you contribute to the government's definition of happiness, but how happy are you at home and what defines your happiness? So you, your partner, your family, your unit, you yourself as an individual, at the end of the day, are you happy or not happy? What's your audit like? And if you're not happy, come to a mental health expert and re-examine your definition, re-examine your formula. And we have to look at our formula every day. It, it must change. It's dynamic. I've talked to you about social media before, right? Not here, but offline. And uh, you've talked about how um, even teenage angst, right? Why, why young people rebel against their environments at home? Um, and I think they're interlinked because, because I think that you talked at the time about um, the paradigm that you offer your child. Is the, in, is the household environment a more attractive place than, than the outside environment, right? And if it's not, that's why they're staying out. That's why they're staying out till all, 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 right. uh, all the hours. Yeah. That's why they're on the machines all the time because... Your home environment where maybe your, your mom is always scolding you, she's nagging you all the time, and it's not something which is palatable or attractive to the young person. Yes. How do you address the social media thing? It's not just social media. That is, you're talking about the home first. Yeah. Is, is your question about, is the home an attractive place? How would you make the environment at home something more attractive so that you can raise healthy children? For starters, let's go into Marketing 101. Yeah. Yeah, you, how do you market yourself? Right? How do you market yourself as a parent saying this consumer called the child wants to spend time hanging around with you? Okay. Now, as a baby, the child has no choice. Biology determines that the child wants to hang around you because you're the source for food and security and survival. The child knows that. As soon as the child realizes it's got choices, aunties and uncles, they'll make preferences. Father, mother get jealous. Lah. Oh, you're spending time with that uncle, huh? Ah. <laughs> That's so true. And again, uncle, then, uh, the fellow bring chocolate and he's more fun. More <laughs> fun. Because you have happy times with that. Then you look forward to that uncle, you look forward to holidays. Then you look forward to friends. So you're, you're graduating. Eh? Now your survival needs are met. Maslow. <laughs> you met already. Now you move next level. Fun, enjoyment, choices, va- variety, all those other things. Okay. So, but are you keeping up with it? As a parent. Ah, are you up to it with social media, with the fun, with the games, with the growing mind? Okay, earlier the mind was a clean slate. All children are born equal, my formula. All over the world, they're all born same. You bring an Eskimo child to Malaysia, I'll bring him up like loving durians. 100%. 
thinking like an Indian, Sri Lankan genetic pool, I'll bring him up like that. Lah. <laughs> or whatever pool, lah, you know, waiting for the durians to drop, but, you know, fishing from the sea. Definitely, because your primary environment determines it. So you got to keep up with it. You got to, de- you got to define the recipe of your primary environment. Okay. Your okay. home. Okay. So let's move away from the young child to, the, um, to depression, right? And I see a disturbing prevalence of depression Ish. among males, okay? Males, retired males above, say, 60, 65 years old, right? And the factors are quite common, right? They've left a high-flying status job. They've, they're no longer the, the man that you were once perceived to be. Yeah. And uh, they've now, you know, um, been put out the pasture. How do you deal with depression among older men? First step is to understand the reason for the depression. No, no, no. Go back, minus one. Ground level. It's normal. Depression is a normal emotion. Acceptable, normal. How you deal with it and why it's there, it needs to be understood. You're talking about a retiree or someone whose major life event change, maybe post-stroke, maybe 60, 70. Death of a child. Doesn't that, doesn't? Death of a child. Death of a child. Significant life event. Things change. Self-esteem changes. Self-definition changes. Role definitions change. Demands change. Not able to cope with it. Not prepared for it. So you are powerless. You are hopeless. Are you really powerless? Can you, you become, do things? Your the perception is there. Okay. Yeah. How do you deal with it? Knowing you're powerless and then re-empowerment. Empowering yourself. Learning new skills. How do you motivate yourself to, be, to take charge again? You don't have to do it immediately. People think that depression is bad. Get out of it quickly. Get over it. Get over it. No, 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 no. Go through it. Process it. You may even post-event enjoy the fact that you went through that because you learned a lot from it. So it's a normal thing. Don't think that depression is a bad thing. That thing called psychopathology of depression is not a bad thing. It's a normal reaction to life events. So the subject in question must realize that he or she is going through that state and then re-empower themselves. If they are not conscious of it themselves, the primary environment or significant others, those people who love him or hang around so with him. So if they know that they are already in that feedback, state, then how do they then deal? Because they can be in, appear insurmountable. Then you go through these various definitions of the various criteria of finally, I mean, you're a deviant, means you belong to the non-statistical norm of yeah. other people have got over it, but you're still stuck there. You're not moving. There's significant personal distress. There is dysfunction. Four Ds, three Ds now. The fourth D is there is danger to self and others. You're becoming suicidal. Mm. If you reach these stages, then somebody else has to take control. We have to look after the species. You're going to hurt yourself. So then we decide that we find out that your biology, your biochemistry, your synapses need reorganization in terms of your, your chemicals. So we give you medication. The medication is to help your brain and your mind process and understand information because now we take you from the depressed, dysfunctional, debilitated zone to I can start rationalizing and processing information because my biochemistry is better. So you go on medication. So you mentioned it earlier, right? So I didn't want to mention it, but you mentioned it. You said that you're quite ill. Ah, yeah. (laughs) Okay, so how do you, you know, talking from personal experience, because this can't can't be entertaining for your life for sure, right? No. How How are you dealing with it? Purely education. I'm informed. I know the side effects of the medication I have. I recently had a second major heart attack and got lots of blocks. We can't resolve all the blocks because they found out that my kidneys are in a very, very bad state. And, and I've been treated for autoimmune disease, which requires me to be on high levels daily, high levels of steroids. I get messages at four in the morning. I'm a bit concerned. I'm like, why is Jammu up at four in the morning? I'm at four, but I don't expect you to be reading at four in the morning. Uh, That's a problem. (laughs) I have reason. So, yeah, so I'm I'm aware of the side effects. I'm aware of why my nose is bleeding all the time. I'm aware of why I'm agitated and my fingers are vibrating. I'm aware of the headache that I have. I'm aware of the flight of ideas and, and things that happen to me. But that's because I'm educated about it. I'm informed. And I understand. Now, you don't have to be a graduate to understand it. But I'm informed as to why my moods can change. And I can attribute it and and live with it. So information is very crucial. Understanding what's going on is important. 
And of course, being honest with yourself, like, you know, I'm, I'm being like this, I feel like this because X, Y, Z. It seems as if just to go back to what you're saying earlier, right, about um, being aware of your health, being honest with yourself, and these are all factors behind happiness, right? Yes. So if, if you yourself, having taught, you know, these things for the last 37 years, and then now you're being afflicted by these things, it does indicate that, you know, maybe your system is not as healthy as, as it once was. My system getting older, Macha. So it's just, it's an age thing. Yeah, it's, no, no, we must never forget that hu- the minute we are born, we've got a lifespan attached to us. The correct. tag is given. Huh? So how, so for someone as, as Expiry date done. Correct. So, so intellectually speaking, yeah. how are you reconciling yourself with the fact that you probably got, probably, right, unless you're Ma there, yeah. uh, got a few <laughs> years in front of you than you got behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got fewer in front of me. I mean, I'm not going to drop dead tomorrow. Yeah. But I could have my heart attack. If it, was, if it was severe. But for me, the measure, I deal with palliative care quite a bit. I prepare people to die. But my definition of preparing people to die or helping people deal with death anxiety and their families with death anxiety. Death anxiety, yeah. Yeah, is, is about uh, how you're going to live today. Once you're dead, this is the anxiety, lah, you know. But this is the worries, you can deal with that. But your definition of death is how you live up to that point. And when they buy that, that idea and that concept, Things change for them very quickly. Do they start buying Porsches and getting well, some younger do. <laughs> girlfriends? Younger girlfriends or they... Oh, definitely. Some start going to Machu Picchu or something? Yes, they do. Many do things like that. Yeah. Then, then they realize the futility of it or sometimes the, the, the relevance why, of why it. Why the futility of and it? And sometimes the relevance. I quickly added that. Yeah. But they realize that that is not what really was going to determine. So they have to do it anyway. They got to buy the Porsche and then say, oh, Lord, it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. Or, the, need, or the younger girlfriend, right? Or the younger girlfriend. Oh, yeah, I went for this holiday. That re- it worked for a little while, you know, like the Malaysia Bole motivation thing. <laughs> It'll last for a little while, and then, but the, susti- the, the sustainability is not there. But if they change the philosophy and the formula, or the mindset and the family mindset, the acceptability of death as a reality, uh, then yes. So, like you asked the question, I've got fewer years ahead of me. I'm not worried about it. I have today. If I'm so worried about day after tomorrow, I'm not going to deal with today properly, man. Right. So there's no point. No point at all. But I'm not going to walk the streets blindfolded. Yeah. I've got to be responsible for tomorrow as well. Yeah. But I'm not going to preoccupy myself with 10 years down the road rather than or 10 years behind the road with guilt and stuff yeah. and forget the relevance of today and how that affects the effect of the little flutter of the butterfly wings and how it's going to affect tomorrow. So if you had a 32-year-old... Um, person in front of you, male or female, right? And you want to give them three pieces of advice to best navigate the volatile world that is in front of them. What will those three things be? Hi, yeah, yeah. That's a very nice a question. Complete distillation of all your. Take this tablet and try it. <laughs> well, it's antithetic to what I normally do, lah. Yeah. Okay. I I would say just go out there, immerse yourself in whatever you do, and reflect upon it every day. That's the first advice I'll give. First thing. First thing is immerse yourself in everything you do. Okay. Positive mindset. That's two. Look for the positives because fundamentally we are almost automatically, what's the word, your default is negative. And is that how, right? Are we, are we yeah, set up? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, in all my talks, we find it, and it is really odd, really funny how it always happens. My slide is prepared, yeah. and people say you tricked us into it. No, 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 it's your choice of vocabulary. <laughs> <coughs> And uh, health. The third thing, health. Health. Nothing else will exist if you're not healthy. La. So brain health. Brain health. Specifically brain health. Yeah. The, we suspect <laughs> that the mind is situated <laughs> along the dimensions of this energy in the brain. La, you know, That's where the mind is. Yeah. Um, it's not in your elbow, you know, because people have no elbows. They still have a mind of their own. Yeah. But it's somewhere here. And if the brain health is, use, is healthy, if your blood is healthy, that's the brain food, um, there's a good chance your mind will be predisposed towards the healthy options of functioning. So your healthy brain, um, which involves things like healthy sleep and health and exercise and the gunk and medicines you take and the side effects, but healthy brain, positive outlook, and be in the zone. Immerse yourself, mindfulness. Basically. Whatever you do. <clears throat> Whatever you do by choice. As much as possible, make it your choice. La. So I would say these three things stop it. La. Those are the three most important things. For me. Now. Today. Now, today. Tomorrow it might change because I'm on a lifespan journey. <clears throat> tomorrow my wife will drop dead. My children might die in some accident. 
uh, I might strike a million dollars. Uh, somebody will come and give me. I don't buy tickets. I won't strike anything. <laughs> somebody might give me a massive gift. Um, something good might happen. You know, it'll change me. The next moment will change. The minute I walk out of your room, things will change. My values will be affected. And values are not written in stone, given the lifespan. Values must be dynamic. The problem is people hold on to values because it's a comfort zone. They are afraid of change. So with this issue called resilience, there's a terrible relative called resistance because people are afraid to change, never been taught to embrace change because they're always afraid that things change. Cannot. Tide changes, die. La. Current changes, die. Government changes, die. <laughs> you know, governments are changing all over the world. Yeah. Parents are changing. Teachers are changing. And you want comfort zone. So we are, we are one of the most resistant animals to change. You know? <clears throat> Very, very resistant. The human being, very vulnerable animal. Jambu, you were really are the man. La. The one hour has just gone by. <laughs> is it just really? <laughs> like that, man. Thank you for coming on.